All right, uh, welcome everybody. Um, people are just still filing in here, but um, I think we will uh, get going. Um, so good morning, everyone, uh, welcome. I'd like to start as people are just filing in, joining us a couple minutes late. I'd like to start by orienting you briefly to the Zoom functionality on this webinar uh, so you can best navigate. After that, I'm gonna go into some brief introductions to the speakers and the flow of the workshop. Uh, so my colleague Megan Fowler is your tech support today. Um, please send her a private chat if you're having any technical issues or you need any further direct support throughout the call. In the top right corner, you can choose either speaker or gallery view for the main presentation. And we suggest that you be in speaker view. You'll be able to scroll through thumbnail images of the other participants. And for the breakout groups, the gallery view is a really nice way to see everybody in your smaller group on one screen. Uh, the mute button, we're keeping everyone muted for the main presentation, but you'll have the opportunity uh, to chat with other folks during the breakout groups a little bit later on. We encourage everyone to turn on their video for networking purposes if you're comfortable with that. And the participants button allows you to view a list of the other participants on the call. The chat button uh, there, the one that looks like a little thought bubble, is really important. The moderators will be sharing links and information with the group in the chat. So to view that, um, Click it, a sidebar is going to pop up, and you can also use the chat box to pose any questions or comments you have throughout the presentation. And we're going to do our very best to get to everyone's questions uh, during the Q&A section of the agenda. And notice the drop down there, it allows you to chat to everyone or privately to an individual. The main presentation is being recorded and will be made available on AFT's website, along with the resource handout with resources um, that uh, Today's speakers will have mentioned, and the breakout groups will not be recorded. Today we're also going to be running a few polls to gauge where the audience is at and keep you all on your toes. So we're actually going to start with our first one now. Um, we want to just take a minute to, to fill out this poll. We just want to get a sense of, of who is here in the room with us. And as you're filling that out, um, I just wanted to extend a, a really formal welcome to the second webinar of the Farms for the Future project, uh, Strategies and Tools for Farm Protection. My name is Jamie Potter, and I'm the New England Program Manager at American Farmland Trust, and I'll be your MC for the next 90 minutes. Um, so looking at these poll results here, let's see. Stop and share results. Can y'all see that? Okay, so interesting. We've got about half of you are nonprofit service providers, which is pretty interesting. About a third land trust volunteer staff, handful of municipal volunteers, regional planners, state agency staff, and others. So really interesting mix of folks. And uh, you know, really, really glad to have so many different voices here on the call today. So a little bit more about the workshop series uh, briefly. This series was created through uh, the partnership and truly incredible efforts of the following people and organizations. Uh, my colleague Megan Fowler and myself at American Farm Land Trust, Steph Morningstar at the Northeast Farmers of Color Land Trust, Meg Quinn at Maine Farm Land Trust, Jeremy Lugge at the Southeast Land Trust of New Hampshire, and Nancy Everhart at the Vermont Housing and Conservation Board. And this project has been generously funded by Jane's Trust. So we are joined today by some really wonderful guest speakers, some true champions in the field of agriculture and land protection in our region. Um, Adam Bishop, uh, Maine Farm Land Trust Farm uh, Protection Program Director. Um, he's not on the call today, but presented a, a really great video we're gonna share with you. Steph Morningstar from the Northeast Farmers of Color Land Trust. She's the Executive Director. Nancy Everhart, who I mentioned, is VHCB's Agricultural Director and Donald Campbell is Vermont Land Trust Regional Director for Southern Vermont. So true, exciting, awesome group of people we have on today. So just a little bit about this webinar series. Uh, this webinar is the second in a five part series of educational workshops that we have designed specifically for land trust, municipalities, and other nonprofits and service providers in Vermont um, who would like to better understand how to support farms and farmers in their communities. And especially due to COVID-19 pandemic, there's, um, and many of you probably have been hearing about this, there's just a growing interest in local agriculture and a, a real desire for more hands-on skills and training for securing a more resilient food system at the local level. 
as well as advancing greater land justice. Therefore, each workshop has been designed to offer core content, state-specific tools and resources, question and answer sessions, and networking opportunities. Each workshop also builds off of the previous one, and we really encourage you to try to attend as many of these as possible, um, or to go back and watch the recordings of each, which will be made available on our website. So last week's workshop offered a broad overview of the principles and tools for developing more farm-friendly communities. Uh, today, we'll dig a little bit more specifically into the strategies and tools for farm protection. Next week, you'll have the opportunity to tune in and learn about solar siting and farmland, uh, followed by uh, strategies and tools for making farmland available to farmers. And lastly, tools and resources for supporting Black, Indigenous, and farmers of color in your community. And we'll go over the dates of these and other upcoming workshops at the end of the presentation. Um, and so just to say quickly, as we navigate the topic of land policy and land justice in this learning space together, we invite you to be inquisitive while open to others' perspectives and worldviews. We encourage you to be as present as possible in listening and engaging during these 90 minutes, but we also want you to be very comfortable. So make sure uh, to get up, uh, get a cup of coffee or a cup of tea, whatever you need that helps you focus. And our hope is really that through listening and learning in this space, that we all leave with a commitment to continue learning and taking some concrete action to advance this critical work in our communities. And the last thing I'll say is just um, a quick overview of the agenda. You'll hear first today from Adam Bishop, who I mentioned he's gonna share his extensive knowledge on tools that could be used for protecting farmland and communities. Steph Morningstar will then give an overview of the work of the Northeast Farmers of Color Land Trust in advancing land sovereignty for Black, Indigenous, and farmers of color, and also what makes me folk unique as a land trust. Um, becoming more educated about land justice is really vital to our collective work protecting land, and our planning team and speakers will be weaving this topic and farmer voices into the workshops that follow. Donald Campbell and Nancy Everhart will then provide an overview of some of the on-the-ground farmland protection work and strategies um, in Vermont, and examples of tools and partnerships you could then take back to your own communities. We'll then have Q&A with all the speakers, followed by a short breakout group activity, and a quick report back from the facilitators before we try to wrap it all up at 3.30. We're gonna try not to go over. Um, so without further ado, we'll launch uh, a video uh, pre-recorded from um, Maine Farmland Trust, Adam Bishop, about farmland protection. And so uh, take it away, Megan. Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you for attending this uh, presentation. My name is Adam Bishop. I am the director of the Farmland Protection Department at Maine Farmland Trust. Uh, we are a statewide land trust in Maine uh, with the mission to protect farmland, support farmers, and advance the future of farming in Maine. Uh, I've been asked to, to sort of take part in this today to give a summary um, or sort of a high level overview of what it means when we talk about farmland protection or, or protecting farmland, um, you know, here in Maine and in New Hampshire, Vermont, all the Northern New England areas that are uh, involved with this workshop. Um, so I'm gonna do that. I'm gonna talk about sort of the nuts and bolts of farmland conservation. But before I do that, uh, I just wanna take a step back for a minute and um, give an overview of, a very short overview of some of the challenges that are facing farming and agriculture in our states. Essentially, we're gonna talk about farmland protection, but why do we need to protect farmland? Um, you know, if there was no threat to farmland, we wouldn't have to do the kind of work that we're talking about today. So basically, what is the threat? What are we protecting farmland from? Um, essentially, we, we at MFT and, and other land trusts like MFT are, have as a goal to protect farmland and to keep farms, farmland, and agricultural land from transitioning out of agricultural use or the ability to be used for farming or some kind of agriculture. And, you know, what does that look like? I think we all sort of have the basic idea. Um, we're talking about protecting farmland from development. So that could look like your, you know, what people typically think of a, a big residential subdevelopment that uh, 
sprouts up on what used to be productive farm fields, uh, it could look a little different than that. It could look like large lot development. Um, you know, we're not talking 30 or 40 houses, but maybe we're talking two or three sort of kingdom lots that divide up a farm into, into non-farmable properties. Uh, it could look like solar development. More and more, that's the case here in Maine, and it has been the case in other states in New England. And we're going we're gonna to talk on that a little bit later and a little bit more deeply in another one of these um, presentations. Um, or it could just look like transition of a property from a farmer to a non-farmer who's not really developing it or dividing it, but just taking it out of use as an agricultural property. So all those things are what organizations like Maine Farmland Trust and other land trusts are talking about when we talk about farmland protection or protecting farming. We're, we're trying to stop those scenarios. And the, when is it most likely that, um, you know, when's the danger point really is sort of one thing that we often think about. And the real danger point is when a property is um, transitioning in ownership. So it's either transitioning in ownership within a family from generation to generation, or it's transferring, you know, from owner to owner outside of a family. But anytime a property is undergoing that kind of transition in ownership is when it's the most vulnerable to uh, move from farmland or active farming status out of agricultural use entirely uh, into some kind of non-agricultural development. So what our organization and other organizations are trying to do is step in and make sure that when those transitions happen, there is something that is protecting the farm from being taken out of agricultural use and, and changed into some sort of developed property. So that's the threat. Um, and I'm sure all of you, some of you have, have witnessed this in your own communities and in your own states, um, farms that were productive at one time now not being productive, maybe being productive in terms of growing, growing houses or, or solar panels or something like that. Um, next, we're going to move into um, sort of, that's what it means when we talk about farmland protection, or that's what we're trying to protect farms from. What does it mean when we say farmland protection? So, and what are some basic tools that are typically used to protect farms? So when, when we say farmland protection, you know, what we're talking about in this context is legally uh, protecting or legally using a legal tool to prevent someone from having the right to develop a, a property, generally speaking. Um, you know, there's lots of tools that land trusts use to protect properties and to protect farms. For example, a land trust could buy a farm and, and own it and intend on owning it uh, for a long period of time and not developing it and leasing it to farmers. And that's a model that's out there and that's a model that works. But by and large, the, the majority, uh, the vast majority of farmland conservation in New England and in the United States is done through the use of a tool called a conservation easement. Um, a conservation easement is a legal document that essentially uh, places a certain set of restrictions on what a land landowner can or can't do on their property. It's a document that gets recorded in the registry of deeds or in the land records of any particular state. It lasts forever. And essentially, when a landowner agrees to encumber their property with a conservation easement, they're giving up certain rights of development that they may have um, prior to the conservation easement. So we in the land trust community, I as a representative of MFT, um, meet with a lot of landowners um, all the time and try to talk them through the concept of a conservation easement, which is a really complex document. The ones that 
MFT uses generally run about 25, 27 pages long. And, and that's a real lot for anybody to digest when you're trying to give, give a 30,000 foot summary of what's going on with a conservation easement. But I try to hit on four main ideas. Um, when you protect a property with a conservation easement, or let me step back to say, there's a lot of different kinds of conservation easements out there. Um, and there's a lot of different kinds of land trusts out there. So there's land trusts and conservation easements where the goal is to protect a property from ever being developed in any way and keep it in a completely natural state. Um, not allow anything to happen there, essentially protect it as wilderness. The types of conservation easements that we're talking about today that, that MFT uses or other, other agricultural focused land trusts in other states, um, generally we refer to them as agricultural conservation easements. And these are sort of the exact opposite of an easement that is requiring everything to sort of stay as is. We want them to be as flexible as possible to allow for a landowner to do what they need to do on their property and have it be a viable farm without, while, while sort of taking away the possibility for non-agricultural development. So the four main ideas that I generally tend to hit on are, number one, um, the conservation easement, an agricultural conservation easement is going to limit the ability of a property to be divided in the future. Uh, perhaps eliminate the possibility of it to be divided or maybe allow for limited division, such as into two farms instead of one farm, but generally prohibit the kind of division that would lead to residential or commercial development. The second main idea is uh, the land trust works with the farmer to designate certain parts of the property where um, buildings, agricultural buildings are permitted to exist, to be developed, to be enlarged, to be replaced, and as much as possible to site those buildings in such a way that we're not taking away from the farm's viability by, say, plopping them right in the middle of all the best fields. The third main idea is that the property's fields are required to be kept open as fields. Uh, it takes a lot of work to turn woodland into productive farm fields, and the existence of those fields is part of what we're trying to protect through the conservation easement. So the easement is going to prohibit uh, or going to require the landowner to keep the fields maintained as fields, either through mowing, paying, grazing, cultivating, any of those sorts of practices. And the fourth main idea that's important to hit on, especially here in New England, where lots of our farms uh, have a significant woodlot component, is that there are some restrictions placed on the types of forestry that can happen on the property. And essentially, we want forestry to be conducted in a sustainable way that doesn't have a negative impact on the property's value as an agricultural piece of land. So that's the tool we're talking about here, um, the conservation easement. Uh, what it does is prohibit non-agricultural development while allowing for enough flexibility for the property to remain viable as a farm. The next part of this is, you know, why would any landowner want to do this? Why would any landowner want to give up the rights that they have on their farm to develop it in any way that they desire um, and, you know, deal with a land trust that, um, you know, part of doing a conservation easement is the land trust has the requirement to oversee what's going on at the farm and make sure the landowner is abiding by the restrictions of the conservation easement. Additionally, if the landowner is not abiding by the restrictions of the conservation easement, the land, the land trust has to take action to bring the property back into compliance. So, so that's just to say that these things have teeth. They're real restrictions. Um, there's no ignoring them. They last forever. Uh, and you know, they've held up in, in court time after time. So, you know, why would a landowner want to enter into this type of relationship? Well, you know, the first thing is to sort of look at it in an altruistic way and just say there's 
landowners out there that want to protect their property as a farm forever, want to have some assurance that after they're gone from the property, the farm is going to remain. It's not going to be developed by their children or by the next landowner. And they, just, they enter into these agreements sort of out of goodwill. And that's how a lot of farmland conservation in New England has been done. And, and what that's called is donating the conservation easement. A landowner agrees to restrict the property in this way, and they don't receive anything for it um, in terms of compensation. So, so here it's sort of important to, to stop and sort of examine something uh, because what does it mean in terms of what does it mean when we say a conservation easement has value? Um, you think about a property, say a property that's worth four hundred thousand uh, dollars. It's a big farm. It's got infrastructure, and that's sort of what the fair market value would be. Then you encumber it with a conservation easement, or you you put these restrictions on the property that say you can't divide it, you can't develop it, you can only build in these areas and so on, uh, it's probably not worth $400,000 anymore. Now it comes with all these restrictions, as well as the land trust, whose responsibility is to, to enforce the restrictions, and say, in this case, that $400,000 property is now only worth $300,000. The difference between the value of the property as unencumbered by any restrictions and the value of it with the restrictions in place, in this case is the difference between $400,000 and $300,000. That difference is the value of the conservation easement or $100,000. We were talking about how people decide we've done a lot of donated conservation easements. And in that case, you're, you're making a donation of the easement to a land trust and you are giving them something of value, the conservation easement. If you're giving that away without being compensated for it, you can get some, some tax benefits. It's the same as if you give money to any nonprofit. You're giving a donation and you can have some, you can realize some income tax benefits. But more and more um, in Maine, and I know in other states in New England as well, the vast majority of our agricultural land protection work is done now uh, through the purchase of conservation easements. So. That is when a land trust enters into a deal with a farmer or landowner and says, we are going to pay you X amount of dollars uh, in exchange. You will sell us the conservation easement on the property. We will receive the easement and, and be responsible for holding it and enforcing it over time. And in exchange for that, the landowner gets compensated a certain amount of money. Um, which in the case of farming works out especially well, because as we all know, you know, farming oftentimes happens on really thin margins and a big influx of capital can be really useful to invest in the farm, to invest in animals or equipment, uh, pay down debt, perhaps um, purchase additional land, perhaps uh, get some equity out of the property that allows a landowner to retire and pass the farm onto their children instead of uh, selling it on the open real estate market. So much of the land protection work that we do in terms of farmland protection um, happens through this type of compensation for the sale of a conservation easement. So we sort of think about that as, um, you know, how do we get from point A to point B, the unprotected property to a protected farm? And sort of in summary, it can happen through a donation or it can happen through a purchase. Easements have value and, and that's why land trusts oftentimes can, can compensate or pay landowners for the conservation easement. So sort of the next section of this is how does that work? You know, where does the money come from? And, and uh, it's different in every state. Um, every state has a different source of funding and, and I'm gonna touch on those a little bit, a different level of funding, but uh, the money can be essentially private 
philanthropic capital, you know, donations that are raised from the community or from members to fund this type of work. Or it can be done with public money. That's through federal or state grant programs that exist to provide funding for this type of agricultural conservation work. Or it can be done through a combination of both of those things. So one thing that all the states that are participating in this series of webinars have in common is that we all use federal funding in some way, shape, or form to help pay for conservation easements on farmland. And that is accomplished through NRCS, or the Natural Resource Conservation Service. That's a division of the United States Department of Agriculture through their Agricultural Land Easement Program. Additionally, Maine, New Hampshire, Vermont all have state-specific sources of funding that can be channeled toward this type of agricultural land protection. So, and, and, and finally, at least in Maine, you know, oft, sometimes there are municipal sources of, um, of funding that can come from the town level to go into this pot that allows for a land trust to purchase the easement from a farmer. So, you know, what motivates people to do this? It's, it's goodwill, it's uh, good intentions, it's money, like a lot of other things in the world. And that's how we get a lot of the conservation work done that we've gotten done to this day. We've covered the basics here. We've covered uh, what the threat is to farmland, what the threat looks like, uh, what it means to do farmland protection or to protect farmland, the tool that we use to accomplish that goal, and how we get from point A to point B, how a land trust ends up working with a landowner to protect the property with a conservation easement, whether it's through a donation or through a purchase, and what the sort of value scheme is that sort of sets up how an easement is valued and what a purchase price might be for a conservation easement, which really varies really widely, um, not only, you know, across the region, but in Maine, it, 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 there's a huge variation on, on what these things are worth, depending on the, a lot of different characteristics um, that are individual to any farm property that we're evaluating for protection. There's a couple other things that I wanted to touch on here before I, before I pass it on to the next um, presenter. And it, just it's, it's questions that often come up from people when we talk about easements and we talk about this kind of thing. The first is um, tax implications. So there's a couple different realms of tax implications that we want to think about. The first is um, what I touched on before. What are the tax implications for selling or donating a conservation easement? If you donate a conservation easement, you're making a charitable contribution. You can um, have some pretty good income tax mitigation uh, as a result of that donation. If you're selling a conservation easement, you a landowner may be on the hook for some, uh, some taxes, capital gain taxes perhaps, associated with the sale of that conservation easement. So it's, it's a complicated thing that landowners definitely want to engage with a financial professional when they're considering doing something like this. The other tax realm that people really want to talk about is real estate or property taxes. Um, you've put a conservation easement on your farm and it's not worth what it used to be. It used to be worth $400,000. Now it's worth $300,000. Shouldn't you pay less property taxes because of that? And at least in Maine, the answer to that really lies in the specific tax assessor's decision for each town. But generally, when I talk to people about these types of tax implications in Maine, and, and I We'll leave it to others to speak to the state specific examples, but in Maine, we have a program um, called current use tax and you can enroll your property as farmland. If you make a certain amount of agricultural income from that land annually, in Maine it's $2,000 annually, you can enroll your property as farmland and have it assessed at a much lower value than um, how it would be assessed as not farmland. 
that's usually the best case scenario for farm owners in terms of their property tax liability. But the most important thing to think about in the realm of taxes is a property with a conservation easement on it remains in private ownership and remains subject to municipal real estate taxes. Every property with a conservation easement on it you know, pays some sort of taxes uh, to the town where it's located. So, you know, many people sort of operate under the um, mistaken belief that when you protect a property with a conservation easement, you're taking it off the tax rolls. And, and that's just not the truth. Uh, all protected farmland protected with conservation easements uh, pays property taxes to the town where they're located. The other thing, um, two other things that I just sort of want to touch on briefly, I mentioned it before and we're going to dive into this in a future um, one of these presentations, but the, the solar, the, the conversation around solar development in Maine is really, uh, it's, a, it's a hot issue right now. There's a lot of companies in Maine that are, that are seeking to lease land or get lease options on farmland uh, to develop uh, solar infrastructure, which, you know, solar infrastructure is, a, is a, a good thing. I think we're all in agreement that renewable energy is a good thing, but just like residential development, um, oftentimes it's the cleared land, the flat fields that are the easiest and the roadside fields that are the easiest and cheapest to develop for residential houses. They're also the easiest and the cheapest to develop for solar infrastructure. So um, just teeing that up uh, for future conversation because that's something we're trying to address here in Maine. And oftentimes large scale solar development of farm fields is not compatible with land that's protected by a conservation easement or could be protected by a conservation easement in the future. And the final thing that I wanted to, to touch on today is um, there's a lot of conversation and a lot of interest out there in terms of what land trusts are doing, uh, specifically land trusts that um, protect farmland uh, beyond conservation easements. You know, you, you protect farms with a conservation easement, you've prevented the property from being developed, uh, and that's great. But there's nothing about that that really says the property has to be farmed or um, is going to be actively farmed anytime in the future. And there's certainly nothing about it that says the a farm business that's located there is going to be viable. So that's why I think, you know, Maine Farmland Trust and other agricultural land trusts are really trying to incorporate uh, farm viability programming into our work to, to not only protect the farmland, but also provide some resources for farmers to have viable businesses in the future. The, the really interesting tool that um, I believe all the states here uh, that are taking part in these modules are, are engaged with to one degree or another is a tool called the option to purchase at agricultural value. So a standard conservation easement, like I said before, you know, requires the property to not be divided, build in certain areas, keep the fields maintained, limited forest management that's done in a sustainable way, but nothing says that somebody can't come in and, and buy that property and do all those things and not do any sort of farming at all. So I'm not going to get into the details of it, and I hope that some of the state-specific presenters will talk a little bit about the option to purchase at agricultural value, but that's a tool that um, different states and different amounts are working into their conservation easements that essentially requires the property to transition from owner to owner in the future um, as an active farm or to a farmer uh, and not be sold out of agriculture completely. So, so th those are just a couple things um, trying to sort of make a nod to the fact that it's, you know, easements are the foundation and permanent protection of farmland, at least in my point of view, is, is the, the sort of foundation of all uh, this agricultural land protection work moving forward. But, uh, you know, you can't have a house with only a foundation and certainly 
Um, as we've done our work in Maine over the last 20 years, in other states over greater periods of time, I think we've all sort of learned that there's more to the puzzle of a sustainable future for agriculture than just uh, permanent protection with conservation easements. So uh, with that, uh, that's the end of my presentation for today. Um, I know there's a, a few other speakers and then some state specific uh, presentations for the, the different states that are involved in this. So I wish I could be there to, to take questions from you all, but uh, I guess the only thing I'd say is thank you for your time today and thanks for taking part in this. Wow, so thanks so much to Adam for sharing his incredible knowledge about conservation easements. Um, we're gonna just do another quick poll to, to wake folks up. Um, and we really wanna kind of just gauge the, the, the type of farm protection and land access work that you all have experienced with in your communities. So let's just take about 30 seconds to, to fill that out. Um, and, I'm intrigued about the responses that we'll see here. And then we're gonna hand it off to Steph in just a moment. Right. Let's see, a few more coming in. So I'm going to end the poll here and I share the results. So that's Super interesting. Um, looks like most of you have protected a farm with a conservation easement. That's really great. Y'all don't need to be here. Um, no, but uh, that some of you have provided, about a third of you provided access to land through a farmer, through sale or lease. That's great. Um, some of you have undertaken projects to address affordability and equity. Really thrilled to hear that. As well as um, a significant number who's provided access to land for beginning new entry or black indigenous or people of color farmers um, and a number of those who who said other um, so that's really great to hear just to get a pulse of, of what many of you have done here in 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 vermont we're going to transition now to hearing from stephanie morningstar again who's the executive director of the northeast farmers of color land trust She's going to be talking a little bit about uh, NEFOC land trust and, and what makes it unique as a land trust and, and some of the powerful work that they are doing here in the Northeast and beyond. Hi, everybody. It's Stephanie Morningstar, Executive Director of the Northeast Farmers of Color Land Trust. We're here today to give you a brief overview of our organization what sets us apart from other land trusts, and how we're working together in a collaborative way to build a racially just and regenerative regional food system in the Northeast. The Northeast Farmers of Color Network um, emerged, basically created the Northeast Farmers of Color Land Trust. So you're seeing here some folks from our August 2019 Skillshare gathering. Um, the Northeast Farmers of Color Land Trust started its work advancing land access for BIPOC farmers in January 2019, emerging from the Northeast Farmers of Color Network. The Northeast Farmers of Color Network is an informal alliance of Black, Latinx, Indigenous, and Asian farmers making our lives on land in New England and upstate New York. There are 21 founding member farms who began the NEFOC network, and the members have grown to over 350 as of today's date. The NEFOC network was built to serve three purposes. First, to break the isolation of being a farmer of color in the Northeast by building relationships of mutual respect and joy, the foundation of all other movement work. Second, we're built to, scare, to share skills, resources, and time with one another through, through mutual aid to build collaborative projects and initiatives. One of the things that we've done recently is we built a BIPOC Farmers COVID Skillshare series that emerged during the COVID pandemic. The third is to coordinate our policy demands and to catalyze reparations for Black Indigenous POC farmers and land stewards. The NEFOC network identified that the number one barrier to feeding our communities healthy, fresh food is access to land. The NEFOC Land Trust was envisioned by the NEFOC network members, serves the will of the network members as a direct response to this barrier, and secured funding to hire a coordinator to manifest a land trust. 
The Neathwalk Land Trust is distinct in that it is a separate entity working to pave the way for equitable land access for BIPOC farmers, land stewards, and earth workers in the Northeast region. The Neathwalk Land Trust will continue to serve the Neathwalk Network members who will directly benefit from the land access work we're doing and building in the Northeast region as well as nationally. Our vision as a land trust is to advance land sovereignty in the Northeast region through permanent and secure land tenure for indigenous, black, Latinx, and Asian farmers and land stewards who will use the land in a sacred manner that honors our ancestors' dreams for sustainable farming, human habitat, ceremony, native ecosystem restoration, and cultural preservation. We're unique for quite a few reasons, but the first would be our for us, by us, and nothing about us without us sort of um, foundation. So everything that we do is led by and for Indigenous, Black, Latinx, and Asian BIPOC folks. Uh, we have an interesting hybrid model that we share, which is um, the development of a community land trust as well as a conservation land trust um, that focuses on um, the development of farmland preservation, Black land loss, Indigenous land theft. We're creating common spaces and allowing for permanent, secure, and inheritable land tenure and cooperative business models. The conservation Land Trust enables conservation and restoration of native species ecosystems, culturally significant lands held in a sacred and, um, sacred and culturally congruent manner, and it, we are advancing personhood goals and policy. All of these two things um, combined, this hybrid model, are meant to and basically affect health, wealth, and joy. So we're looking at building healthy, permanently accessible land, healthy communities, growing our own foods and medicines, a joyful honoring of our cultural lifeways, native species ecosystems in balance, a new economic system that reclaims, builds, and shares wealth. We're looking at drawing down carbon, building thriving soil, and creation of, respect, of respecting creation or respecting nature as a living being. So some of our unique approach is that we're really deeply rooted in systems change and emergent strategy. Um, everything that we do is based on taking a look at where is the root cause. So a lot of the root cause of the lack of land access for us certainly comes to um, forward is systemic racism. Um, we are, again, BIPOC specific. We're also 100% BIPOC, BIPOC led. We have a deep relationship with building, um, building relationship with indigenous communities through our indigenous consultation process. Again, we're a hybrid land trust that is um, building common spaces as well as incorporating conservation practices. Um, we really found a lot of the work that we do on land-based wealth redistribution. Um, we're also trying to create a, a, a carbon drawdown in the Northeast through our land holdings, and we really um, appreciate and draw on um, the the vision of decentralized leadership within this structure. So really looking at global indigenous approaches to leadership and governance. So thanks so much, Steph. We had to uh, cut that off there. And um, Steph is going to be providing a much more detailed historical context and more specifics about the work of NIFOG and how you can support their efforts in the region in both workshops four and five that are coming up soon. So please come back so you can just get super inspired about the powerful work that NIFOG is doing in the region. Um, but I'd like to hand it off now to Nancy Everhart and Donald Campbell to dig into some Vermont specific tools resources, and examples of farmland protection efforts in Vermont. Great. Thanks, Jamie. Um, and thanks, Donald, for joining me in this. Um, and I think Megan is going to put up our slides. Um, I think that's the last one. And Donald and I are going to do a little bit of tag teaming. I'm going to start off and then pass it off to him, and then I will wrap up. So I think our assignment really is we heard a great overview from Adam from Maine Farmland Trust, and much of what he said, of course, totally applies to Vermont, but now we're going to drill down a little bit to how do things work in our state? Um, you know, where are we at now? What tool, a little bit more about the tools we use. And um, I'm hoping, you know, Jamie had mentioned before, there is a chat function. So if particular questions come up while we're, Donald and I are talking, please put things in the chat because we'd love to have some good Q&A. So a little context, again, I'm Nancy Everhart. I know some of you, but certainly not all. I'm the Ag Director at the Vermont Housing and Conservation Board, and we're sort of the centralized um, source of state funding for, for farm easements in Vermont. Um, and we work really closely with a lot of different federal partners, private partners, 
um, towns and others, and we'll talk a bit more about that, but it's a very much a, a, a team approach. And we've been really successful in Vermont. If you uh, joined us last week, you heard from Julia Friedgood at AFT, Vermont ranks really high in, in the work we've done um, nationally, and we're proud of that, but it doesn't mean that there isn't a lot more that we can do and things we can improve on. So uh, there's a few statistics here for you to look at. We, you know, these are just ones that VHEB has funded. So the work that Vermont Land Trust or other land trusts have done with private funding isn't reflected in this, but we, we've got a lot to be proud of. We've protected you know, a, a lot of our good soils in the state, but there's a lot more to, to be done. Um, and we do uh, use the option to purchase ag value now, and Donald will talk a bit more about this later on, on every deal we do in Vermont. So a lot of our, uh, a high percentage of our projects include that. We started using that in 2003. And I'll try to sprinkle in some examples as we go, though I know we don't have a lot of time. This uh, farmer, uh, if you don't know her, is Lisa McDougall of Mighty Food Farm. And a great example of the kind of projects we work on together. She had been renting land for 10 years, built up a, an awesome CSA and panel, but didn't have secure tenure. And working with Donald and Vermont Land Trust, found a farm to purchase um, in um, Shaftesbury and was able to move her business there. Um, and so the next slide. Um, so quickly, we, we do have um, policies and guidelines that are all available on our website, vhcb.org. We're, we're looking, as um, Adam emphasized, we're not protecting open space. We're protecting work, actively working farmland. So that is a key criteria. It has to be an active operation. We look at the soils um, using the NRCS maps. Are they prime or statewide agricultural soils? We look at the location. We, we have been really focused on adding to blocks of conserved farmland around the state. In some cases though, it may be equally important to protect like the one remaining farm in a, in a hill town that doesn't have many farms left. So it can mean, we can look at that from different aspects. We look at the infrastructure. Do, is it sufficient to, for the current operation? Um, and we look at management, both the resource management, and we'll talk a bit more about that. We're very focused and work closely with some of our partners at the Ag Agency and, and NRCS on, on those um, projects and, and bringing additional, resource, additional um, resources in terms of dollars if, if, if the um, management is lacking. We really wanna help farms um, and lift up the environmental stewardship. And we're also, also looking at sort of management of the operation and other, other tools we can offer through, for instance, our viability program on, on that and business planning. So it, we're looking at it holistically. Uh, next slide. And so just in Vermont, um, generally a project will start with really with a land trust. It could be from with someone like Donald or someone from the Vermont Land Trust or Upper Valley Land Trust, two of our key farm protection partners. It could be with one of you, someone from a conservation district or a town, you know, just having that first conversation with a landowner to make them aware that this, this could be a possibility and connecting them, them with someone from a land trust. Um, we have a, a pre-application committee that meets three times a year. In fact, we're meeting in a couple days that kind of takes a first look at projects to see if they meet our minimum eligibility criteria. Those pre-apps are brought to us by, by land trust generally. And then if, if they do um, meet that threshold, VHCB will help pay for an appraisal of the property. Adam explained how that works. Everything we do is based on appraisal. If the landowner likes that appraised value and is interested in moving forward, they'll work with someone from the land trust to negotiate a purchase and sales contract and a draft easement. And, and the land trust will submit a funding application to VHCB. And when our board, which meets several times a year, uh, commits funding, we're really committing a combination of our state funding and the federal funding. You know, in Vermont, um, the federal funding is a crucial source of money for us, and we we've, we've sort of have a centralized approach uh, to that. It, it wouldn't have to be that way, but VHEB has historically been the only entity that's applied for the federal funding. Certainly our land trust partners could apply directly, but we've found it collectively more efficient to, um, you know, to work together on, on an application and then be able to combine those resources when um, farms come to VHEB for funding. 
and, and a key criteria for us also and our, our board of our quasi state agency is farms have to be in, you know, in good standing with our water quality regulations, the, the required ag practices, RAPs. Um, so we'll do the next slide. And so I've mentioned most of these partners, um, so I'm not going to repeat them, but I just want to emphasize it's a critical, you know, team approach and we work with, with many valued partners. When we fund a project of VHB, we co-hold the easement, but we don't have the capacity to be the primary steward of the easement. Adam explained that's a, that's a serious responsibility to make sure the easement is upheld. So we have agreements with our two key land trust partners, Vermont Land Trust and Upper Valley Land Trust, and they are the primary stewards of all the easements for farms that we fund in the, in the state. And again, we, as we're working to conserve a farm, we're often also working with business planners or, or UVM extension people, people from conservation districts to really provide a, you know, a team of people to help that operation um, get the resources it may need to expand, diversify, um, address a manure management issue or whatever it may be. We, you know, we, we're investing in these farms and we want them to be successful. Um, Next slide. And, and yeah, just to reiterate, NRCS is a really key partner and basically every farm we do in Vermont is conserved with federal money. So it's, it's, it's crucial. And you know, with federal money comes also some um, you know, requirements and, and effort at, at meeting those. But there, it's a great partner. Uh, next slide. And this, yeah, I think Donald, this is where you take it away. Well, thank you, Nancy. Um, Vermont farm easements uh, take a lot of different forms, but we, one of the interesting things was to look at some of the feedback from other sessions. And there was a, there was a great um, number of individuals that said something like, we'd like to see more flexibility in the easements or we'd like to see easements that could be different. And I think one of the things about easements is that they have been carefully crafted over the years to really be durable over the course of perpetuity. And as a result, they're not that flexible. And um, as if that wasn't inflexible enough, we then have a number of minimum D terms that come down from NRCS that really make, uh, make it very clear what the easement needs to look like. So I think it's fair to say that we use a template easement that very rarely changes as we, as we move through farmland conservation for better or for worse, and that, that has implications downstream. We, we frequently include or exclude housing uh, depending on the, the needs of that different farm. Every farm is, is highly individualized, and the option to purchase at agricultural value, as Jamie mentioned, has a really, uh, I'm sorry, as Adam Bishop mentioned, has a really important part of this. I think one of the things that we discovered, particularly in the Meadowy Valley early on, is that we were merrily going along conserving farms two, three hundred acres at a time and uh, not putting affordability restrictions on them. And sometime around the late 90s, early 2000s, we began to realize that we were inadvertently creating future estates that uh, people from down country were happy to come up to the Meadowy Valley and buy a couple of hundred acres of conserved land and have it as a gentleman's farm. And uh, that, so that became very blatant to us when a, a conserved farm sold for first $900,000 and then $1.2 million for a conserved farm. So we decided that we had to do something very serious. And, and that was about the time I started at the Land Trust since 2002, every easement that I've worked on has had this affordability mechanism in it that keeps farms affordable for the next farm buyer. It also drives a lot more value in the conservation easement. We've, we've recently, fairly recently, uh, within the past decade, really worked to do a lot more with riparian buffers and ecological sites. We've worked very closely with the state to drill down on some of the natural heritage things. So I'd ask maybe to go to the next slide and it's, uh, maybe knowing that 31% of you are land trust staff and another 50% work for nonprofits, I'm going to figure I can talk at the 200 level here and we can share the dirty little secret. Um, but really, we could conserve every farm in the region and still not save farming. You know, it's not really going to be about whether we conserve all the farms, it's going to be about whether we conserve the farms and work to keep farming going. Um, this notion of conservation as being a holding action, I think, is the way we need to think about it. Conservation 
keep things from getting worse, but we need to keep doing the other hard work to make sure that farms are viable, to make sure that markets are strong, to make sure that people know um, what the impacts of eating healthful food are, and that uh, all, all those pieces kind of come together. One of the interesting pieces I noticed in the, in the pre-work looking at who's on here, I, I don't know you, Zachary, but I noticed that you, uh, you had commented that you wanted to find out uh, more about beyond conservation. And I think that's a really, I think that's a really interesting notion for land trusts at this point, as we've gotten used to using a conservation tool, but we recognize that that tool itself is not going to save farming. So I'll talk about that in just a second. But of these seven items, for those of you, uh, okay, 80% of us work for land trusts and nonprofits on this call, but I'll bet a large number of you are either um, some form of municipal officer, maybe planning commission or, or select board. And uh, so about half of these elements really affect directly what you could do in your community, what, what towns can do to support and promote farmland protection. Maybe half of these have to do with what we could do to conserve more land and the other half really have more to do with how we promote farming as a business and how we keep farming strong. So. The one tweener might be current use. You know, I, I really think that all municipalities should be encouraging people to go into current use because it's practice for conservation. If you can't handle being in current use, you certainly can't handle a perpetual easement. Um, but it also leads to really good management of land. And now that it's, uh, now that at least in Vermont, now that it's been structured so that it doesn't really impact local taxes, a very small hit to the municipal side. Uh, it's a it's a really good program to encourage people in. A lot of people that come to land conservation uh, go to current use first. Uh, zoning is really important. Uh, I'm a planning wonk myself and I, I love the zoning side of things, but at least three things a community should be seriously considering if they want to promote agriculture. You know, this notion of um, PRDs or kind of clustered growth, the idea that you could have zoning density by putting uh, a number of houses in a small area and then protecting a larger area. So rather than having a 100 acre farm broken into 10, 10 acre lots, you might have 10 acres that was uh, highly impacted and 90 acres that got conserved as a result of that. And that, that kind of flexibility and zoning is important. Growth zones are critical. We, we pay really close attention to uh, where communities want to see growth and where they don't. If, if a community has a high density zoning, we will go directly to the municipality and say, look, should this land be conserved? And quite often they'll say no. Another one that uh, Adam mentioned very briefly, and we've been through here in Bennington, I'm on the select board, uh, you know, Act 74 to do with the solar siting. If you want the substantial deference piece that from the from the PUC, you really need to come up with a, a, a preferred solar siting map. And if a community has a solar siting map, the land trust can pay attention to that and can can work around areas that a community has specifically de uh, designated as, as ideal for solar infrastructure, three phase power, access to three phase power, and not obtrusive and other things. Town plan is obviously critical because it, a lot of it. Um, sets the priorities. We go to town plans on every single project um, and certainly drive zoning. And having a conservation fund is something that many communities have opted to do. Uh, it quite often makes a project just that much easier if you have a little bit of money uh, that you can use to leverage federal or state money. On the, on the farm business side of it, you know, the business promotion is critical, food aggregation centers, education is, is completely critical because we need not only to build consumers, but to build the next generation of farmers. Uh, farmers markets are, are a great example, but we also um, have a number of other examples. We've got a regenerative food network kind of coming online here in the southern part of the state that's, that's, that's really got a lot of people excited uh, because it's focusing on um, aggregation and distribution, making markets, creating markets, making farming more profitable. Um, but you know, sort of an aside that the COVID's really encouraged us to look a little bit beyond our traditional tools. Um, and as I mentioned, easements are really permanent and kind of inflexible for a reason. They're meant to be that, that very, very uh, serious holding action. But what happens before and after an easement is, is kind of the interesting part of the new thinking that's coming on. And um, so this involves uh, uh, trying to figure out how we foment business planning. Many, cases life coaching 
for people, uh, creative financing and ownership structures, markets and distribution, as I've mentioned, education for both supporting farmers um, and consumers. Uh, very recently, we the Vermont Land Trust got involved in an emergency assistance for COVID, you know, in terms of giving direct grants through emergency assistance to farmers. And carbon sequestration certainly needs to be on that list. There are opportunities for uh, farmers and landowners, but we, if we don't address uh, climate change, we, we've lost the big game. Uh, so one of, the, one of the things I think land trusts need to do, and I'm saying this to the 81% of us here that are, are, are really working on these things, is I do feel like we need to really use our access to money and to skill um, to leverage meaningful change that looks uh, that looks a little different than what we've been thinking about up until now. A very brief example is, is a, a $9,000 grant that, that we were able to direct towards a, a, a potential community kitchen effort in Dorset. And that led to um, farm gatherings over the course of this past winter. Uh, all the farmers in the Medway Valley began getting together and talking about what they needed in terms of making their farm businesses viable. Then COVID hit. And um, Liz Rafa, who was going to be on this call, but she's not on this call, she works for Merck Forest. And uh, she and a number of other people in Dorset pulled together essentially a curated CSA of, from the people that had been part of this farm network and began um, pulling together food that the community bought um, robustly. So they, they had fantastic markets through this curated CSA uh, in that area at a time when they were unable to sell their specialty project products to most other markets. So, you know, sort of a small example of trying to think a little bit out of the box. Very difficult for a nonprofit with a specific mission. Um, and I'm not advocating for all land trusts to bail on land conservation and start doing economic development. But I think if we don't think about this bigger picture um, of farm viability, then uh, we may end up, it may be a fair victory. We may end up conserving a lot of farms, but not saving farming. So that's that's my summary of what towns can do. There's a lot more we could say about that, um, but I'll turn it back to you, Nancy. Yeah, maybe a question for Jamie. I know we're about out of time. I don't. Do we have time to look quick? Yeah. So we we had a few examples. Uh, this this is one I chose because it represents uh, an opportunity when a small local land trust raised money privately and also got a town contribution to help conserve a farm, which really helps us at VHB. It leverages the, fe the federal money. And we have many examples of helping new families get on the land. We have tools we can come back to an already conserved farm and maybe fund retroactively an option. Here's a farm we just closed last week. It, interestingly, Jamie, it, 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 I think this got one of the AFT mini grants. You know, we're, we're getting new farmers on the land, which is really exciting. And, and it's a part of a rural community economic development too. So. And again, our crucial business planning partners um, through our program and, and others are a big part of this and, and all the other partners. So uh, I, I know we're kind of out of time for the other examples, um, but there's lots more we could say, um, lots of great successes. I know, uh, I think Craig Privet's on here, so I do want to mention one of the pictures there was that Upper Valley Land Trust project we did, the Hodge Farm. I don't know if you noticed that a couple slides back. So um, anyway, I will stop there. Um, because I think we're about to go to breakouts. Is that uh, right? Well, we have Q&A first. So oh, um, yes. I hate to cut out these great examples because they're some of the real real good stuff. But um, you know, we'll make these publicly available on our website right after. But I don't want to miss out on the Q&A because um, there are some really great questions. And I'd like to, um, I guess the first question I'd like to uh, send over to Steph Morningstar, which is how can land trusts and towns best partner with the Northeast Farmers of Color Land Trust? And um, how can we as land trusts and towns be better allies? Yeah, um, thanks for asking. Um, we get this question all the time. And the first thing that we can, um, we can share is that um, we get a lot of requests for partnering on different projects and looking for technical assistance around um, building equity, diversity, and inclusion strategies for, for land trusts across the Northeast. Um, we are happy to partner as long as you've been doing your work and you have um, some internal, um, internal work already done on equity, diversity, and inclusion. We, are not, we don't have the capacity right now to actually help with building those for you, but we are happy to partner on 
um, various different easements, transfers, lots of different things, different projects that will help farmers of color access land. As you know, 99.2% um, of the farmland in the Northeast is owned by white folks. So we're trying to just get a couple more percentages, percentage points on that to um, make some space for our farmers. Um, so yeah, contact us if you're looking to help farmers of color um, gain access to land. Um, we also have a webinar series. We're just wrapping up our final webinar um, for the spring summer series starting in um, on March, on, sorry, August, I'm still stuck in COVID times in March for some reason. August 31st with Leah Penniman discussing cooperative land tenure. Um, we are, um, that's our final, in this spring summer series, we're taking a bit of a break and then coming back in late October with our fall winter series. So please be sure to check that out. Um, it's a great way to, um, you know, learn on the go and um, share with your organizations different things that you can do um, in order to partner with us. Uh, let's see, we're, we're distributing right now probably one of the most important things that you could do is we're distributing a survey right now to the Northeast. Um, that's a BIPOC farmer survey. And that's, um, we're trying to reach as many Black Indigenous POC farmers across the Northeast as possible. Um, we know that they exist. There are many out there. You may or may not know who they are, but we're looking to understand um, their needs for land as we start to acquire land. Um, we have a reparations page on the Northeast Farmers of Color website that you can check out, and that's a peer-to-peer -peer mechanism for direct reparations. So that's um, always a great place to um, see who you can support. It's not meant to be an extractive list where you would contact them for inclusion and programming or anything. Um, and then, yeah, I think just, you know, keeping us visible, keeping in connection with us, advancing our work, cheering us on, helping offer, um, if you have technical assistance that you'd like to offer, we are so here for that. Um, we are a, a young land trust, but we're gaining ground exponentially, and I don't intend that pun, but maybe I do. So, uh, <laughs> um, thanks so much, Jamie. Thanks so much, Seth. You guys are just doing such incredible work, and I'm, I'm so glad that um, for those who didn't hear in the beginning, Steph's going to be um, presenting information on both the fourth and, and fifth webinars. So we definitely hope you'll come back for that. Um, but to get to a couple more questions in a few more minutes that we have, um, one came in from Sarah Armstrong. And the question was, it's been mentioned that conservation easements can be a tool for affordability. They only work once. What tools are being developed for affordability down the line? For example, we're seeing conserved farms being listed for 600 to 800,000 in Chittenden County. That is what they are being appraised at. Um, so Nancy or Donald, do you want to take that one? Sure, I can start. And I think, um, you know, in Vermont, we have some farms that were conserved in the first, say, 15 years or so of our program, which, which may not include the option to purchase at ag value. And since then, we have included those. Um, even with the option to purchase at ag value, I mean, really what that tool does is it um, allows us to step in to a sale if it's not to a farmer or a family member of, of that farmer. Um, and so it doesn't um, necessarily restrict affordability between farmers. And if farmers are willing to pay, you know, if there's a lot of competition for farmland, then um, ideally that would mean that our ag economy is strong. It, it doesn't always mean that, but uh, that, that in and of itself can drive up uh, farm prices. But one tool that we do have for farms that were originally protected without the option is to facilitate a transfer. We can come back in and add the option to that easement and, and pay for it. So we, we work on these projects. Uh, we have funding usually for two of those a year. Uh, that's one way we do that. And we are also working with partners, particularly Vermont Land Trust, or they're doing some of this work not you know outside of VHUB to especially on older easements, we're very focused, as Donald said, on, on water quality protections. And there is funding sometimes to add additional restrictions to easements relating to riparian buffers or wetland protections. That also brings additional river corridor protections. That brings additional money to farmers. So there are some tools that we have. I mean, it's a great, it's a great question. Yeah. Great, and because and we are a little low on time, uh, there was a question in the chat from Allison Lowe about um, creation of farming community where new housing is clustered around conserved farmland for use of the residents. Um, Mike Gia from Land for Good did chime in there with a, an interesting example. Um, if you have any other uh, thoughts about that, you know, feel free to, to answer that in the chat, but we, do, we are gonna move on to our breakout groups because these are really fun and I don't want you all to miss out on this. 
Um, so very quickly, this is how this is gonna work. Please stay with us. What's gonna happen is that in a few moments, we're gonna all be magically transported into a new Zoom room with four or five other people. And you will have a facilitator in there who's, who will identify themselves. And they're gonna just leave you in a short sharing exercise. And the hope is really that you just get to network, get yourself off mute for a bit, and really to leave the breakout group with at least one concrete idea of what step you might uh, take to advance farmland protection efforts in your community. Maybe something inspired you, maybe you wanna go off and do some more research or follow up with, with some of us um, to advance something exciting in your community. So uh, stay tuned, we're gonna hop in these rooms and then we're gonna come back and, and wrap up after that. So we'll see you all back in about 10 minutes or so. It's gonna be a quick breakout. All right, Megan. Send us off. All right, welcome back everybody. Um, I hope you all had a lot of fun in your breakout groups. I know they're, they're just too short and I'm sorry if any of you got cut off or didn't get to, to share your action item. But I think we have just a, a, a couple minutes to very quickly share some of kind of the high level um, things that came out of, out of our meeting. Um, and I'll go first because I was in breakout group one. Um, where there were just three of us in there. And the, the main conversation was really about zoning. Um, both Alice and Lowe and John Roberts are involved in different capacities and trying to, to further kind of both economic development and, and zoning measures at both kind of a town and, and regional level and, and how challenging that can be um, on the ground level when you're actually trying to affect change in communities and you've got neighbors who are um, not necessarily wanting to see that change. So um, excited to see that you know, they're working tirelessly to kind of get new zoning measures into place that, that you know, protect the land base, but also try to support the economic, um, you know, development and sort of the farm viability aspects for the farmers in their community. So I'll, I'll kick it off to uh, our next person. Breakout group two was Jill, I believe. Uh, Jill, would you like to very briefly summarize some of the high level actions that came out of your group? And you might have to unmute yourself. Hey, Jamie, this is Emily. I'm going to actually report for Jill. Oh, thanks. Great. Thanks. <laughs> she had to jump off. Oh, uh, uh, yes. Thanks. So there was just two of us, um, but <laughs> uh, uh, we had a couple, a couple of things um, that came up. One sort of building off of Sarah's question about um, post-conservation generational transfers or, or other transfers and really wanting to think about how we can um, support uh, farmers that have already conserved their property and, and being creative in, in getting farmland to the next generation of farmers. Um, and it's something that we're thinking a lot about it up in the northwest part of Vermont. Um, and, and how do we get new and beginning farmers on land and what kind of options do we have um, uh, for either purchasing those properties or other tenure options. Um, and then we also talked about water quality and how land trusts and conservation just conservation districts can team up um, around water quality and and um, how can we really even more meld both conservation easements and natural resource conservation um, so great for our, our topics perfect great great report back uh, Steph you want to go next hi yeah um, the biggest I would say the biggest outcome that we had from the conversation really focused on wanting to know if there were, um, you know, wanting to link farmers with resources that will make them successful on land. So what are the resources out there? Who are they? Um, and how can we collaborate with one another in order to ensure that we get farmers onto land um, who are prepared for that? So looking at um, linking our organizations and partnerships in order to be able to uplift each other's work and ensure that uh, the success of farmers. Great, thanks Steph. Donald, you're next. Thanks, we had a number of uh, things that we talked about, including taxes and all sorts of other things, but we had, uh, we had Mary Ellen Franklin from uh, one of the last two farmers in, in Guilford and 
then Liz from Waterbury Center and me from Bennington. And one of the things that we all agreed on, and I think VHCB does a pretty good job of this, is that uh, it may sound counterintuitive, but we really should be putting a premium on the sort of last couple farms in a region. In other words, uh, just because there's hundreds of farms in the Champlain Valley doesn't mean that we should overlook the last two farms in Guilford, for example, you know, that, that each, each community needs some farms, both from a cultural point of view, uh, from a food security point of view, and um, just from a, a sense of self point of view. So I think, uh, again, VHCB, uh, Nancy, you guys do a great job with this, but um, this idea of really putting a premium on those last farms, not um, a penalty for, uh, you know, well, that's not a viable farm neighborhood or something like that. Great. Thanks, Donald, so much for that. Nancy, you're up next. Yeah, there were three of us, um, Mikey and myself and Lauren. And um, my, again, building off Sarah's good question, Mike had some, a very concrete suggestion really to VHCB, which is we should look at raising our cap on the retroactive options that we fund because sometimes it's less than the appraised value. And also putting more money into that. Um, and that's a sort of a bigger funding question, but that was like a, a practical response to what more can we do for the farms that we've protected that, that don't have the option as part of them already. Um, so we talked some about that as a, as a resource. And we also talked, and Lauren is looking to move into Vermont, we talked about, you know, what's the best way to start when you're talking with land, farmers in a community who are nearing retirement age and about what their options might be and um, kind, of, kind of where to start that conversation, how it's helpful to start by understanding what their goals and needs are and then figuring out how best to connect them to, again, there's, we have a lot of resources in our state, many of which I'm sort of seeing and looking at here with all of you. So um, yeah, we had a great conversation. Great, thanks, Nancy. And last but not least, Willa. Hi, um, I was with Craig and Sabina. We had a great conversation. Um, interesting uh, talking about, from Sabina's perspective, working at or volunteering with the Jericho Underhill Land Trust and it's a group that's doing a really great job and she was saying that she knows all the resources and tools that are available but um, finding some way to really put them to work so is there a way to find a mentor that could sit down with you and review the zoning regulations or looking at the prime ag soils map and really picking out the key places to start for a group that's just getting started themselves in their community because there's just so much um, so many tools and so many resources to, to use Great, thanks Willa. So we're just, I know we're just a couple minutes over time. I'm gonna take literally one minute to wrap us up. Um, so please just stay with us if you can. Um, so just here on this slide, this is a reminder about the three remaining workshops in this Farm for the Future series coming up over the next month. We encourage you to register soon if you haven't yet, Spaces is filling up. Um, we also wanna just give a very special thanks to today's presenters, um, Adam, Steph, Nancy, and Donald for sharing their wisdom with us. I'm sure they'd be happy to receive any uh, follow-up questions from any of you, so please don't hesitate to reach out to them. Um, next, I just want to um, ask for a favor from all of you. Um, we'll, we will be sending you an email after this uh, presentation today, but I'm also going to paste a link right here in the chat right now, which is just a link to a quick survey. We're hoping you'll just take five minutes or less to fill it out. It'll help us improve the workshop as well as to better follow up with you in the future about any further resources that you may need. So just to thank you in advance for, for taking the time to do that. So if you wanna click on the link, uh, that'll have it open in your browser so it doesn't disappear. But again, we will be emailing that to you as well, probably in a day or so. And then lastly, on our last slide here, we just want to wrap up by saying thanks again for being here with us today. It was super whirlwind, but I hope you are feeling inspired, that you've got lots of great information. Uh, feel free to follow up with, with me or any of the speakers with any questions. We very much hope to see you next week at the Solar Sighting and Farmland Workshop. And um, this recording will be sent around to you as well as be made available on AFQ's website. So again, thank you all so much. We hope you have a really great day. and. Um, Best of luck. Stay safe out there. Bye. Thank you. Thanks, Jamie.